So I think I've heard maybe six different pronunciations of SESAM today already. So I think we need an, an extension of SESAM to map all of the pronunciations to the, the common standard. <laughs> all right, so um, as part of the th this theme of talking about potential extensions to SESAM, I'm going to be talking about um, mapping of data structures and in particular whether we should even uh, consider this to be in scope for SESAM. So um, I can go over these fairly quickly because we've talked a bit about this already today, but SESAM was originally, of course, intended for simple mappings between named things, things with identifiers, um, you know, maybe mapping between the concept of um, person in schema.org and maybe something in the, uh, you know, uh, the concept for, for human in the uh, NCBI taxonomy ontology. Um, SESAM doesn't really care what the nature of the things that you're mapping are. Um, they could be instances, so this is different uh, representations of me as an instance in Wikidata and in, uh, in ORCID. Uh, they could be classes, as m I think most of our use cases here so far have been mapping uh, classes, but they could also be properties as, as well, or relationship types or metadata elements, um, what have you. SESAM doesn't really care, it's all, it's all in SESAM's, uh, SESAM's wheelhouse. Um, but I think it's important to note as well that these represent different use cases. One of the main use cases for uh, class and instance uh, mapping is entity normalization. But when you get into kind of properties or metadata elements, that starts taking a little bit into kind of schema mapping uh, territory. And here things get um, a little bit kind of like different from what we've, we've um, looked at doing so far with SESAM. So, you know, um, an example here might be um, I may have one um, schema, uh, my model schema, and in that I'm representing persons as uh, things that may have a, a full name. And uh, maybe I want to map this to schema.org that maybe has different concepts for uh, a given name and, oh, I'm sorry, one of these should say given name and the other one should say a family name, um, and as, as it does in this slide. So, um, uh, you know, you know, many of us are coming from the, uh, the, the kind of like the formal ontology community here, so we might kind of like think, ah, I can, I can model this using my, my ontology. I can say um, a full name is a thing that it's a kind of concept and it can be broken down using relationships like has part from the OBO relation ontology and say uh, the name has parts, a given name and a family name. Of course, this is, example is very deliberately simplified just for um, illustration names you should never make simple assumptions about this like like names uh, there's a wonderful little essay that I've linked to there about falsehoods programmers uh, believe about names but you should read that but let's just kind of pretend for the moment that uh, names follow these kind of simple simple rules um, and um, you can see that there are actually ontologies in Oboe that do a nice job of uh, representing kind of like these kind of more complex relationships between metadata elements such as personal names, family names, given names, the little P here in OLS represents a, a part of relationship. So, um, you know, one of the main use cases for doing this kind of thing is going beyond our kind of typical SESM use case where we want to say maps, map concepts in Uberon to a different anatomy ontology so we can transfer data across. Here we're getting into actual um, taking data that is represented in one database using one schema and then mapping that over to um, an equivalent or close representation in a different database using a different schema. Or maybe not in a database, maybe it's just JSON documents or RDF triples or, or something like that as well. And you know, I think historically we've said here, you know, don't use SESAM for this. This is not the kind of problem that SESAM was originally um, developed for because if you want to do something like this, then you're getting into kind of like complex schema transformations where you may want to concatenate given name and family name together with a space to make full name and so on. And that's really not, you know, been in Incessant's wheelhouse. Um, but, you know, this does overlap with, um, you know, a use case where maybe the mappings between the schemas are simple and iso isomorphic. Maybe both schemas have a given name and a family name, in which case I think it would be perfectly applicable to make a little assessment table where we've got the different metadata elements and we, um, we can map them just using predicates like SCOS exact match. 
And this makes it nice to do transformations between data represented in one schema and in, in another, again, with the same, the same caveat. Um, so um, maybe it's tempting to think, well, some of these cases where we've got kind of like names can be broken into subnames and so on, maybe we can just overload schema, at, uh, overload SESM, add an extra field, um, and then we can go about, go about our business using the same nice kind of standard we, we've used all along. So we might think, oh, we could just go ahead and have something like subject value derivation um, and um, you know, maybe give this a kind of expression. We can maybe even reuse a language like you know, the Sparkle kind of like query language to give this an expression that could be evaluated in a standard way. Um, but it, yeah, it maybe feels a little bit ad hoc and it doesn't really seem like it will generalize to other use cases because I've focused on this one so far, but there's many other things that you might want to do. Maybe if you're mapping between clinical data models, you have a variety of different ways in which you can represent just basic kind of like quantity value measurements that you might take about um, a person or an organism. And it seems hard to think how, how you could kind of like just do ad hoc extensions like this to SESM to, to cover these kinds of use cases. And again, going back, I think, to one of the questions earlier, which is like, yeah, that seems like, yeah, it's overloading a TSV to, to do something like this. Um, and so again, we can kind of think of these in terms of like just kind of broad use cases, uh, at least think of schema mapping in terms of broad use cases. We've got these kind of simple isomorphic mappings, where it's very tempting and probably quite valid to use SESM here. And there's a lot of data mapping crosswalks that make sense to do things like this. If you look at just um, some of these kind of like metadata schemas like DCAT and schema.org and Dublin Core, there's a lot of crosswalks that are just, yeah, this term in this, this metadata schema is the same as this one. Uh, it's isomorphic, you know, we should just you should go ahead and use SESM. But there's a lot more in the of kind of complex kind of mappings and this includes you know, mapping between FHIR and OMOP. Here I mean the OMOP uh, data model rather than kind of the OMOP vocabularies, clinical data models in general, general, and also kind of like the kind of complex knowledge that we might store in kind of like genome knowledge bases and knowledge graphs, you know, uh, things like the gene ontology, the Alliance of Genome Resources, Monarch, and so on. They're very different schemas that can be mapped and it just seems to be overloading a uh, system to do that. Um, so I think, well, are there other frameworks that can help me here? And, you know, we can ask ChatGPT. Um, and of course there are. <laughs> you can't do this in Italy, of course, unless you've got a VPN. But there are, you know, it suggests about kind of like five different kind of like frameworks for doing this kind of schema mapping. But this is actually only touching the ocean. Many of us are coming from a, a semantic web community uh, background. So there's um, a lot of emphasis on things like YARML and, uh, sounds great, YARML and uh, R2RML. Um, but there's also in the JSON world, there's things like JSLT. In the FHIR universe, there's FHIRMAP. Um, there's, um, again, in the semantic web universe, if you're familiar with Shex, there's ShexMap. I'm not sure if there's also a Shackle map, but there, there might be. Um, and in fact, there's an entire industry dedicated to doing this kind of thing. If you want to run your data transformations on the cloud, you can, play, you can pay kind of like Salesforce a lot of money to do this kind of thing. And of course, at some point, someone pops up and says, well, what about category theory? It sounds like this can all be just done using morphisms. And you go, wait, what the hell is a, is a morphism? And at this point, you just say, OK, this is just too complicated. I just want to do my data transformations in, directly in Python or in SQL, which is perfectly acceptable, but it has the disadvantage of it. it suddenly your, your, your mappings become uh, less declarative, less fair, and so on. But you know, maybe we don't even need to worry too much about this kind of thing, because maybe in the future we just chat, ask chat GPT to kind of like map us, you know, map our OMOP data objects to fire, and it kind of seems to do a reasonable job so far. Um, so with all that in mind, we, um, we actually went ahead and kind of like defined a simple, uh, data transformation language as part of the, the LinkML ecosystem. This is still very much in its early days. You might ask, why are we doing this? Why do we need yet another one? There's a few kind of like, you know, motivating reasons I won't go into it kind of like here that makes sense for us in the, in the LinkML community, just to give us a kind of brief overview of what LinkML is. It's um, kind of polyglot data modeling uh, 
uh, language, um, and it essentially kind of parasitizes a bunch of other frameworks. So you can define your data models using LinkML, and then you can use them in a kind of semantic web context, or you can use them in a more traditional data modeling context with JSON schema, SQL schemas, and, and Python, pydantic objects, and so on. Um, this is just um, an, a simple example of something defined using the, the LinkML data transformation language. Again, we don't try and cram this into TSVs. You know, YAML makes a bit more sense here. But you can see this is a mixture of essentially sesame style isomorphic mappings where, say, you want to map um, from person in one schema to something like prov that calls, calls this an agent. Um, we may have kind of like these direct mappings, such as, you know, in this schema it's called name, in this schema it's called label. But you can also start doing things in here like adding kind of expressions and more kind of complex uh, transformations and so on. So I'll just kind of leave that. I think uh, maybe Nico had some other questions, but just to me, the, the main discussion here is what, does this even have a relationship to Sesame? Um, you take this microphone because you're well, far away from there. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> And, um, well, I'm done anyway, so. <laughs> but I just want to leave you this question here, which is, you know, does this even make sense, you know, to discuss this in relationship with, uh, with SESM? Um, and I think, you know, so, so long as, you know, we're working with schemas that are relatively isomorphic, it, it seems to make sense, but then there's a lot more use cases where uh, the mappings are not isomorphic, and then it seems that we want something that's, you know, not so much an extension, but something something different um, altogether. So I'll just kind of leave that leave it with that uh, discussion point here. Okay, just give me a second. All right, um, we have time for a bit. Okay, you have a softer voice than me, I think. Okay. We have time for a, a few questions uh, before we move on to um, question, some questions to you. Does anyone here want to ask anything? Was there any question on Zoom? Um, okay. So, oh, she, um, on those last two, on the last two cases that we've talked about, mapping between schemas and mapping between, you know, complex mappings, they're important, but I wonder if you extend this into those things, will that deter people who would use it in the simple scenario? Going back to the, the previous um, kind of like uh, set of slides from Tiffany and kind of Nico's proposed solution there, I feel there's a nice elegant solution that keeps things within, you know, the, the whole philosophy and remit of, of SESM. Once you start getting into something more like schema mappings, then I think it really starts overloading things. But it doesn't mean we can't have allied and adjacent standards where we reuse certain kind of like components and we have well-defined mappings between <laughs> those different components. Um, so the question is, what, what's the kind of boundary line, really, and when do you go from one to the other? Um, sorry, you went through, the, there was a slide that had kind of a YAML declaration of this mapping earlier on. Um, so is that not already a specification of this? Like, how does that link to a potential, like, this is very different from SSOM, it's clearly not, mm -hmm. a, not a tab format, it looks more like LinkML. It so is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is, why do we need, um, is this not enough? Is this the, <laughs> is, like, is this not enough to specify it? What, why would it need to be like, a, an SSSOM thing? Or would this be incorporated into SSSOM? I, I, I don't know exactly what incorporated would mean, but yeah, to me that's the main, the main question. And yeah. I, I think, yeah, you It seems like quite a departure from the TS, because SSOM is currently a, a, a tabular format, uh, it's TSV. And exactly, yeah, and that may be yeah. the most reasonable thing to just consider these as kind of like, you know, separate endeavors. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we should recognize there's a kind of overlap in use cases. People who may want to just map from dcat to schema.org, for example, then SESM is kind of like simpler than coming up with a whole data transformation language because it's a nice, simple, isomorphic problem. So maybe rather than viewing them as being completely separate, we could view them as allied efforts with well-defined ma mappings would, between them. Would, would LinkML not be a better place for this to live then? Or? Well, in fact, it is where this lives at the moment, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, yes, we sh yeah, I, 
I'm kind of partial to that solution that you know, you're, you're, you're proposing there. But I want to keep these to be very, very kind of like um, allied solutions that kind of like walk in, in lockstep together.